Greetings and welcome to another lecture on foraging. Now we're going to continue with optimal foraging theory simply because it is something that is very important and it is something that uh, you know we want to make sure we cover thoroughly. So I do want to talk a bit about the topic of what's called risk sensitive foraging. Now when we're talking about risk here we're not necessarily talking about life and death okay or as I say life and limb. What the risk here is the variance in the food intake. Remember how much energy is being taken in. Um, so, and, and generally what we're pointing out here again is patches, which is how much patches vary in the amount of food available. In our former bear example, the bear was foraging in berry patches. And if you've ever gone foraging in berry patches yourself, you know that there are indeed some patches that it seems like there's berries everywhere and some where berries are a lot harder to find. Or maybe the berries aren't completely ripe or whatever else. So the risk here is we need to take into account the fact that Every time an individual changes patches, they take a risk. They take a risk that the patch might be worse. They also take a risk that the patch might be better than the one that they're in. And so a lot of variables more or less go into whether or not a particular individual is risk averse or risk prone. Are they risk averse? Do they not want to take risks? Are they happy where they are? Do they not want to have to possibly go out and run into trouble? We tend to see this in animals that aren't very hungry. And again, this is a lot of this is just logical. If you're not very hungry, you are not going to risk life and limb to go out and find a better patch if the patch that you have is just fine, or even if you don't need any more patches. Okay? So when we're talking about animals that aren't very hungry or animals that are well fed, as it says, they're going to value each additional food less and less and less. And therefore, they prefer to forage in patches that have a low variance. Your book talks about a difference, for instance, if we have two areas of patches that have an average food size or food whatever of eight, one with low variance means that all of them are going to be around eight. All of the patches in that area are going to be around eight. They might be one higher or one lower, or maybe even two higher and two lower, but they're all going to be very close to eight. And an animal that's not very hungry is going to be fine with that. An animal that is not very hungry is not going to risk moving on because they're happy with eight. On the other hand, maybe there is an area of patches where the variance is much higher where the patches vary a lot more from patch to patch and how much food they have. They might average out to eight, but they might vary. One might have one and one might have 16. You might remember something like this from your statistics class, if you remember anything from your statistics class and haven't blacked it out. So these animals that are well-fed, that are basically not very hungry, maybe they're not well-fed, but right now they're not very hungry, they're going to prefer to forage in low variance where they may not get any jackpots, but on the other hand, they're not going to strike out either. They don't really need the jackpots. They don't really need 16. Okay, they're fine with eight. Eight is fine. On the other hand, if you have animals that are very, very hungry, they are starving, they have not eaten in a while, they are much more likely to take risks. They're much more likely to change patches and look for that jackpot. Okay, they want that 16. And if this sounds like gambling to you, then yes, indeed it is. It is indeed gambling. Except animals here are not gambling with money, they're gambling with food, and in many ways they're gambling with their lives. So if an animal is very hungry, it will value each item more and more to a point, of course. I mean, it's, it's not going to get to the point where it's spending so much energy rushing from here to there that it makes matters worse. It is burning more calories than it would get by sticking around in what it has. But they are much more likely to take chances. They are much more likely to move on with high variability. They like high variability because they might get that jackpot. Okay? They need that jackpot. They need that 16. They, they can, you know, they don't want to just go for eight. They want to go for 16. They want to win it all, baby. Okay? They want to have all of it. Let's see that 16. Okay? Bring it on. I'm going to find it. I'm going to win the jackpot. 
Yeah, if you've ever gambled or watched people gamble, um, people who aren't really interested, well, people people who aren't hurting for money, very often people who just won a lot or whatever, they're going to be a lot less risky. They're going to be risk averse. They're going to instead play games where they may not win a lot, but then again, they're not going to lose a lot. On the other hand, if you have somebody who's lost a lot of money, which is analogous to our hungry animal, they are much more likely to take bigger chances. Let it ride. Okay, you know, let's let's you know, let's let's go for the jackpot. Let's bet it all. As opposed to someone who's like, no, I'm not going to bet it all. I don't need to bet it all. I'm doing just fine the way that I am. Animals do the same thing. But as I said, instead of doing it with money, they do it with food. Now, that's about all that we're going to talk about optimal foraging theory, at least explicitly. It does underline pretty much everything in this chapter and quite a few things in other chapters, chapters as well. I mean, quite frankly, you could apply a lot of optimal foraging to things like looking for mates, right? Breeding. If an individual has already passed down a lot of his genes or her genes, they may not, you know, they may not want to go for that jackpot and try to have as many babies as possible. They may just want to make sure they have as many as they can afford. And yeah, it really does apply to a lot of things. But what I am going to talk about a little bit right now is terms of foraging and groups. Now, a lot of times it might seem that it would make more sense, particularly when individuals are not, you know, they're not a pack of wolves trying to bring down an elk, where you pretty much have to have a group in order to be able to do that. One wolf cannot bring down an elk unless the elk has a broken leg or is otherwise extremely damaged. But in a lot of other individuals, even in animals that you might not think need to be in groups, actually foraging in groups can increase the amount of food, not just the amount of group, the food total, but the amount of food that each forager gets. Okay, so I get X amount of food if I forage by myself, but if I join up with you, I will get X plus Y amount of food. Okay, so they can and do, in fact, wind up with more food. Sometimes this is, you know, purely by accident. Sometimes this is just simply that the presence of more individuals is more likely to provide food. Okay, if you've got individuals, uh, birds that are hunting insects, the more birds that are poking around in the grass, the more likely insects are going to fly up. And even if I don't get one that I flushed out, you might get it. And then you could flush one out and I might get it so that we all wind up with more food. So oftentimes, more foraging basically means more food for everybody. Now, you could really see this, and there's actually, if you, if you want to, to, to look up, uh, as usual, I have videos, except I can't show you the videos here because it won't play the sound on my screen. So I've actually uploaded a, a Word document with links to videos. And there is a video about food balls. So if you look on that page and click on the YouTube link for food balls, a food ball, you, you might have seen this if you've watched Blue Planet or some of the other uh, nature documentaries that deal with aquatic animals. Because a food ball is just what it sounds like. It's a group of small fish that essentially are flocking together. Okay, they're flocking together in terms of their own version of the selfish herd. If there's a whole bunch of us together and a predator comes, I'm less likely to be eaten because hopefully they'll eat my buddies first. But what often happens is when the school of fish forms up like that, is that predators will come, all sorts of different predators. This is not coordinated necessarily. But sharks come and tuna come and uh, sailfish come and birds come and, and dolphins come and whales come and everybody basically comes and they're all going at this food ball that literally is a ball of food. It's a ball of fish. And the presence of those predators on all sides, including the air with the birds, means that those fish can't escape anywhere. Any time they try to escape, there's a tuna there, there's a dolphin there, there's a bird there. And so therefore, they just more or less get wadded into smaller and smaller balls, which makes it easier and easier for the predators to then steer through or pick off the fish on the edge. They don't have to go far to hunt because there's this ball of food right there. And everybody eats. Okay, except for the fish that are getting eaten, of course. They, uh, they unfortunately do not eat. Everyone else eats. 
uh, do watch the video. It's really kind of fascinating to watch. Um, in addition, it might be good to have other individuals around you. It's sort of the same way I was talking about for the fish, but in this case, for individuals who are going out to feed, not necessarily predators. But yeah, I mean, if I'm by myself, I'm going to be really paranoid about making sure that a predator isn't sneaking up on me, which may mean that I can't find food as effectively because I'm constantly looking over my shoulder. On the other hand, if I've got all sorts of other individuals around me, not necessarily coordinated again, but if there's all these other individuals, then they are likely to see a predator, maybe before I would, and I can concentrate more on looking for food for me and less on looking for predators because we're all looking out for the predators. So in that type, the selfish herd also helps. Not so much that the other individual might get picked off first, which indeed might be true, but also that you can piggyback on their alarm calls. But sometimes we do indeed have cooperative hunting. Um, various species of dolphins have been known to do this with food balls, where they will quite literally put um, the fish into a ball, and one by one, like they're taking turns, they will swim through the center of the food ball and grab everything they can. Or in the case of when I showed, I think I showed you a video of the mud nets a long time ago, the mud nets, uh, where a dolphin will swim around in a circle, beat their tail in shallow water, put up a, basically a wall of mud that fish can't see, and either the fish freak out and try to jump out of the net into the mouths of the dolphins, or again, the dolphins will either, you know, surround the mud net, to take, or they'll take turns swimming through it. Again, grabbing fish as they go, while others keep the mud net going, while others keep the food ball going. So we can definitely get cooperative hunting as well as just more of, you know, what looks like cooperation but isn't. Here is the uh, address for the YouTube food bowl if you want to type it in yourself, but it would be a lot easier to just go to contents and look for the uploaded page I have. Another good thing about basically uh, foraging, and I basically talked about this a little bit when I was talking about the selfish herd, is what's called public information. And public information is when one individual in a group gets information about what's happening by watching others. They're not really communicating, well not talking, they're communicating, but it's not a deliberate communication. But you know, if, if you're uh, traipsing through the woods, even as a human, and all of a sudden you hear birds all start screaming over on one side of the path, squawking and crows and by bombing, you have an idea there's something going on over there. That's public information. Or if you're in a group, um, a lot of dolphins, for instance, swim, well, not a lot, but like spinner dolphins will swim in giant pods, giant groups, and they will all swim so that one eye is looking at the outside so they can keep an eye on things. And if one dolphin sees something, they wake up and react, and the others then wake up and react. So they can use the information that they're getting from others to get them information. You know, if, if everybody is swooping in, we have something like uh, vultures. If a vultures will often circle within eyesight of one another, and if they see another vulture swoop down, they'll come and swoop down because they might say, hey, there's food there. Or if the vulture, you know, takes off and flies away, then they're not going to swoop down. Individuals that forage in groups can basically see then, if we forage in a group and you're not getting any food and I'm not getting any food and they're not getting any food, it might be time to go. On the other hand, if I'm not getting any food and you're getting food, it might be time for me to wander over in your general direction. So this is all communication, but it's not deliberate communication. It's not the way we tend to think of it as language, as you know, going, hey, come on over here, we got food. But still, animals that forage in a group or that forage around others can indeed use this information to help them forage more effectively, or even, shall I say, optimally. <laughs>